In June 1773, an illegitimate 16-year-old boy from the West Indian island of Nevis landed in the divided colony. Like a seed blown by happy chance onto perfect ground, one man later said, the young Alexander Hamilton arrived in New York on the eve of an extraordinary transformation. In the years to come, he would do everything in his power to hurry the city on toward its ultimate destiny. He is, after all, a bastard from the West Indies. He is the quintessential upstart. He's not born in America. He's got no long history. He's a New Yorker, very much a New Yorker. And his belief that anybody who had intelligence and ability had a right to rise is certainly very much the New York immigrant story. Hamilton threw himself almost immediately into the whirlwind of debate sweeping through the colony. In 1774, while still a sophomore at King's College, he published an incendiary pamphlet urging New Yorkers to defy the English Parliament and lay claim to their natural rights as free men. He was soon mesmerizing crowds on the New York Commons with his fiery political oratory. I think the image of Alexander Hamilton at the age of 17 being able to incite entire mobs of New Yorkers to rebel against the British crown. To me, there is something so typically New York about that. I mean, here you have this guy who comes to probably the only place he could have come to in the United States and really made a name for himself. And immediately, through his own brilliance, but also because the city is so accepting, becomes this important political figure while he's still a teenager. Hamilton wanted that war badly, no matter what the issues were, because very early on he said, it is in war that a man makes his reputation, and it is in moments of flux and change that a man can rise. So unlike some of the established leader, political leaders of New York, he's certainly someone who wants to see the revolution come on, no matter what. To the shock of most loyal New Yorkers, Hamilton's wish came true sooner than even he could have imagined. On Sunday, April 23, 1775, a frantic messenger came galloping into town down the post road from Boston. Blood had been shed at Lexington and Concord. The American Revolution had started. In New York, jubilant patriots immediately seized control of the Customs House and City Hall. Alexander Hamilton threw himself into the revolutionary fervor, eventually rising to become one of George Washington's closest aides. But a cloud of gloom soon fell over the island city, as even the most ardent of patriots could see that Manhattan would be all but defenseless before the guns of the British Navy. Within days, a massive evacuation of New York had begun. In the next nine months, 80% of the city's population fled Manhattan. To an astonishing degree, the key to New York City's rise, and with it the rise of America itself to urban greatness, would lie in the hands of one man, the brilliant combative immigrant from the West Indies, Alexander Hamilton. No one in his own era disputed his genius. There were people who didn't like him. There were people who wished him dead and one who killed him. But no one disputed his genius. And the brightest of them understood exactly that this was a man to be feared. Not because of his personal power, but because of the vision that he had for the development of the country. Within days of the British surrender, Hamilton had joined the flood of New Yorkers returning to the city, bringing with him his wife and infant son. They settled in a house at 57 Wall Street, just down the street from his arch enemy and political rival, Aaron Burr. Within a matter of months, he had opened his own law firm, helped set up a society for the emancipation of slaves, then organized the city's first bank, the Bank of New York, 
which opened for business a few blocks away. In 1785, new neighbors arrived. The brand new Continental Congress, unable to decide on a permanent home, set up temporary headquarters in New York City, on Wall Street, right next door to the Hamiltons. In the years to come, Hamilton would do everything in his power to keep the capital in Manhattan, convinced the future of America lay not in the countryside, but in the city. He made what is essentially the ultimate urban argument that city air breathes free. It was his argument that people are freer, there's a greater exchange of ideas, there's more opportunity for men uh, to acquire wealth in a commercial urban universe. Most people don't realize New York was really the first capital of the United States. Indeed, if the United States were like every other major country in the world, it would have been the capital. New York was a very logical place for a national capital. It was easy to get to. It was relatively centrally located. Historians should never play the game of what if, but still it's hard not to wonder what New York City would have been like had it become the political capital as well as the commercial, financial, and, and creative capital of the country. At noon on April 30th, 1789, George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States in New York City from the balcony of the old city hall, which New Yorkers had optimistically renamed Federal Hall. The new president quickly brought in Thomas Jefferson to be Secretary of State, though the Virginian loathed New York, which he called a sewer filled with all the depravities of human nature. Alexander Hamilton, just 33, was named the nation's first Secretary of the Treasury. And though the appointment came through on a Saturday, he went right to work. From his new office in the Treasury Department on Broadway, a few steps from newly rebuilt Trinity Church, Hamilton began mapping out the blueprint for a new kind of nation, one based not on plantations and slave labor, but on commerce, manufacturing, and immigrant toil. To a startling degree, he was mapping out the future of New York. Look at what he understood. In a country that was 90% agrarian, here's a man who understood that the future of the country was in manufacturing. Here's a man who understood what banking could do to develop the economy of the country. How you could use tax money from the many, put it in the hands of the few, and produce, as a result, a manufacturing revolution, the beginnings of industrialization in a country that was, what, two decades old. Southern planters immediately rose up in opposition to Hamilton's program. The mobs of great cities, Jefferson warned, add just so much to the support of pure government as sores do to the strength of the human body. Certain the nation's future lay not in the city, but in the countryside. Jefferson insisted the capital be moved out of New York to a rural setting just across the Potomac from his native Virginia. It was the beginning of a fateful split in American life, one that would pit South against North, country against city, and lead ultimately to civil war. Jefferson had this vision of the country being an agrarian country full of yeoman farmers. It was a vision that never existed even in his time, um, certainly not as he would have liked to have seen it. Um, but he loved that vision and he hated all things commercial. Hamilton loved commerce, he understood money, banking and money and flow of power through the economy. Unlike Jefferson, who never understood money at all, and which may account for why he was born one of the richest people in the colonies and died deeply, deeply in debt. Already, this split between a commercial manufacturing society and an agrarian staple crop based society, between dynamic capital and capital that was invested in property and slaves and not as manipulable. These splits were already evolving given Hamilton's programs for the new nation. 
In the spring of 1790, the debate over the capital came to a fateful climax, over another volatile issue, crucial to the success of Hamilton's economic programs. There was at that time a major issue dividing the, the new nation, and that is the debt incurred during the Revolutionary War by the respective colonies at that time. Some had not incurred much. Others, such as Virginia, had paid theirs off. New York had the most. Well, New York should have had the most. It's where the most important fighting took place. Hamilton had one idea for the new nation, which is take up all that debt and have the federal government say, we'll pay for it. You incurred this debt honorably. You, in the aftermath, we have a national government. The national government will pay that debt for you. Don't you worry. But once again, Southerners were adamantly opposed to Hamilton's vision, reluctant to pay off Northern debts and fearful of increasing Northern power. With Congress hopelessly deadlocked, it was now an open question, one congressman warned, whether this government is to exist for the ages or be dispersed among contending winds. On the evening of June 20th, 1790, with the government hovering on the brink of bankruptcy, Hamilton went to Jefferson's house on Maiden Lane, hoping to find some way out of the crisis. He said to Jefferson on that fateful meeting, we have to assume the Revolutionary War debt. Jefferson made a fateful offer. He said, all right, we'll do it. If you move the capital of this new nation from its natural site in Manhattan to a swamp on the banks of the Potomac, which turns malarial in April, such that any congressman who stays around till May will never get back. Uh, and uh, what could uh, Hamilton do? He um, accepted it. He was smart enough to know that wherever the government was located, if it was pursuing the kind of aggressive developmental programs that he wanted it to pursue, that he was going to win in the long run. It was more important what the government did than where the government did it, was a Hamilton's view. And ever since, one of the defining characteristics of the United States has been that the political capital was in one place, and the cultural, economic, intellectual capital was in another place, because that never left New York. Some New Yorkers were devastated by the loss of the capital, but Hamilton himself was philosophical. Almost immediately, he had the Treasury Department issue $80 million in government bonds to pay off the huge new debt the federal government had assumed, and money was soon flooding into New York as the trade in government bonds soared. On May 17, 1792, two dozen stockbrokers gathered under a buttonwood tree on Wall Street to figure out how to handle the enormous volume of business Hamilton had generated. It was the beginning of the New York Stock Exchange. I think one of the real turning points in the history of New York is that it doesn't become the federal capital. If it had ever become the federal capital, it would have been an entirely different city. It would have been a kind of London, very concerned with its past. It would have had military monuments. It doesn't have that. It just remained a place to do commerce, to come here. People came all the time to make money. If it had become the capital, of course, the city would have been much more outlooking. It would have had to encompass the entire country. Whereas being freed of being a political capital, it was able to look after only its own interests and to pursue those interests with, with great vigor. I really have this sense that New Yorkers said, well, if you don't want us to be your capital, that's fine. We'll just go it alone. We don't really need the rest of you. We will simply make all of you a suburb, and we will become the commercial emporium of the new world. It was the beginning of the greatest run any city has ever had. Almost single-handedly, Alexander Hamilton had kicked into life the most powerful economic engine on Earth. Along the way, he had helped invent the future, 
not only for himself, but for the city and country that had allowed him to rise. I think he believed that meritocracy, which is the way in which Americans join capitalism and democracy, it is the way in which there can be great wealth, but there can be no barriers to anyone of talent, hard work, determination, and ability achieving them. I think that that combines the two. He was no friend to real democracy. He was not at all interested in the masses of people having political voices. But I think he was very much interested in creating a dynamic society in which anyone of ability could rise. That's really American democracy in action. In 1799, Hamilton's efforts to end slavery in New York State finally bore partial fruit when the Gradual Emancipation Act was passed. One year later, Hamilton left government and retired to a handsome estate in Upper Manhattan and watched his city grow. By 1804, New York's population had more than doubled in less than a decade, climbing to 80,000. That year, for the first time in its history, New York surpassed Philadelphia, though Hamilton himself would not be around to savor the triumph. He was challenged to a duel by Aaron Burr, whose political career in New York, Hamilton had almost single-handedly destroyed now, they couldn't duel in New York because Hamilton had been instrumental in getting a law passed forbidding dueling in New York. His own son had been killed in a duel. So they adjourned to Weehawken, New Jersey, and do battle in the early morning in 1804. Of course, when they got there, for whatever reason, it is true, Hamilton's shot went into the air and Burr's shot went into Hamilton. And he died at what must have been a quite painful lingering death uh, overnight, and was astoundingly mourned. A man who in many ways had never been a popular idol and had made bitter, bitter enemies. It was recognized that the country had lost an extraordinary figure. On July 13th, 1804, after one of the largest funeral processions in the city's history, Alexander Hamilton was buried with full military honors in the graveyard of Trinity Church, just across Broadway from Wall Street, in the heart of the city whose future he had done so much to secure. He was just 47 years old. New York was on its way. In the century to come, the world that would rise up around Hamilton's final resting place would be a stunning monument to the magnitude of his achievement. <laughs>